Excerpt from the chapter, Drinking Mates. Blues guitar master Phil Manning and I visited North West Australia together in 1993. Touring up in that remote region was a bit of a daunting prospect, simply because it was so far away from the rest of the country. Driving there from Perth took days, and flying was only available from one carrier, so the price for a ticket was pretty steep. Nevertheless, I'd been up to the North West a few times previously, and Phil had been up there himself in years past, both as a member of pioneering Australian blues band Chain and as a solo artist. So it came to pass that we booked a weekend of shows, two nights apiece in the coastal town of Caratha and the inland mining town Newman. After the second gig in Caratha, we were chatting to one of the local lads at the bar, and he asked us where we were headed next. When he heard that we were bound for Newman, he asked which route we intended to take to get there. Oh mate, don't go by the highway, that takes about seven or eight hours, he said. What you want to do is turn off just out of town and take the service road by the railroad track. It's so much quicker. You'd be mad to go by the highway. His friends were all in agreement. No one in their right mind takes the highway when they know about this far quicker service road option, apparently. Phil and I thanked them for their sage local wisdom, then later ran the idea past the bar owner, who also concurred. Oh shit yeah, the service road by the railroad track is way faster, that's a good tip. The next day we left Caratha in our rented four-wheel drive jeep in the searing heat of the morning sun. A short distance out of town we took the turn off the locals had told us to look out for the night before and started towards Newman. It was a good feeling knowing we were privy to a secret shortcut, as well as knowing we'd be taking in scenery most other tourists wouldn't have seen. The bitumen shortly gave way to red dirt, which flew up in clouds behind us as our jeep sped down the straight road, through the low scrub. As we ran alongside the railway line, the road started to get rougher. Signposts displayed a maximum speed of 20 kilometres per hour, and frankly, it would have been quite a feat to drive above that for any length of time. The track we were on became progressively more rugged the further we pushed on, and we grew more thankful we were in an all-terrain vehicle with each lopsided mound we climbed and each dirt-filled valley we plunged down. The service road was a dead-set shocker, but we pressed on through empty countryside, unsure how long we'd be on this track for. Hey, Phil, I said, imagine if this track is leading us into the middle of nowhere. This didn't seem much of a stretch, really. Hours went by without so much as a freight train passing us, let alone any other type of vehicle. As the sun beat down from the cloudless sky, the distinct impression was dawning on us that we'd been the targets of a local in-joke. No one could seriously think this was a shortcut to anywhere, could they? We had to laugh, picturing those guys meeting up and asking each other, you reckon those dimwits actually took that road? But then the bar owner had backed them up too. Surely this wasn't something Caratha townsfolk all got in on, sending visitors out into the middle of nowhere. By the middle of the afternoon, we were sure we'd been set up. The track we were on hadn't improved as we crawled along over the undulating landscape. We'd been driving at this stage for nine hours and hadn't spied anything remotely like a town or even a solitary abandoned shack for that matter. Hey Phil, I said, imagine breaking down on this godforsaken track. I wonder how long it would take before anyone else came past. I can picture the news report. Locals who last saw the pair in Caratha the night before their disappearance said they warned them not to use the service road by the railway track but they seemed determined to have themselves a bush adventure. Phil tried to find this funny, but we really wanted to get off this track before the sun reached the horizon and was starting to feel like that mightn't happen. Apart from anything else, we hadn't eaten in all this time, somewhat naively thinking that we'd have happened by some small town before now. Rounding a bend, we later saw a sign pointing off to our left down another dirt road towards a place called Wittenoom. I think we should head that way, matey, said Phil. We need to find out just how far we are from Newman. A little way down that road, we blew a rear tyre. What were you saying about breaking down out here? Phil chuckled as we climbed out to survey the damage. The spare tyre was easy to locate, but it took a while to find the jack and the wheel brace. Stored as they were, it transpired after much searching, submerged in muddy water that sloshed around inside the panel behind the side-mounted rear seats. Imagine if the spare tyre is flat too, I said. Phil chuckled again, but asked me to please keep my predictions to myself. We managed to become covered from head to toe in red dirt, changing the tyre, but we climbed back in with relief, keen to see who we could get directions from in Wittenoom, however far away that was. Phil started the engine and put the Jeep into gear, but instead of taking off, a loud screech was emitted from the rear wheel, and the Jeep did a small skid before stalling. He tried it again with the same result. This wasn't good. 
We hopped out and managed to eventually ascertain that the rental vehicle had been supplied with a spare tyre fitted to a wheel that was the wrong depth for this particular model. Instead of turning, it simply seized up against the brake mechanism. We decided that the best option would be to put the original wheel back on, even though the tyre was blown, and putt slowly towards Wittenoom. From now on, no more saying, imagine if, OK, matey, said Phil. I agreed not to muse out loud anymore on this journey. Fortunately, Wittenoom wasn't too far away from where we'd blown the tyre, but our prospects of finding anyone to get directions from didn't immediately seem very promising. The entire town looked to be deserted. There was a hotel which had a boarded up window. None of the houses had cars in the driveway or any other signs of inhabitation. It was eerie, the stillness of the place in the fading daylight. Then suddenly, a car appeared from a road up ahead. It pulled up beside us and one of the two middle-aged guys inside asked us, in an easily detectable English accent which seemed out of place in this remote outback locale, if we needed any help. We would have looked like we needed assistance standing bewildered next to our lopsided jeep covered in grime. We explained the scenario and they said that they could repair the puncture for us back at their place. They asked where we were headed to. When we answered that we'd come from Caratha and were playing in Newman that evening, they were incredulous. What are you doing here then? We told them that we'd come down the service road by the railway tracks and they looked at each other with raised eyebrows. No one drives down that road, you won't get to Newman that way. As they fixed up our punctured tyre, we asked them what was going on with the mostly deserted town. It turned out that they'd been working in the mining industry, but the town had been condemned due to asbestos contamination. The whole place is riddled with the stuff, one of them said. Not that you can tell. He said that whilst reaching down to pick up a handful of dirt from his driveway. He ran the dirt through his fingers and showed us the asbestos fibre that remained in his palm. With renewed incentive to immediately vacate the district, we asked why they still lived there. With grim faces, they said that they can't afford to move and no one will buy a house in the town now that it's condemned. As for the mining company, they apparently were told that they could try and sue them for compensation, but that a representative had laughed in their faces and said something to the effect of, yeah, see you in court in about 80 years, boys. We thanked them profusely for their help and with new directions towards Newman and the windows rolled up tightly, we left Wittenoom with three and a half hours still to drive.